a recitation and commentary on Libius Woods, War and Architecture. 3. Remnants of War. Building on the existential remnants of war. Wherever buildings are broken by the explosion of bombs or artillery shells, by fire or structural collapse, their form must be respected as an integrity embodying a history that must not be denied. In their damaged states, they suggest new forms of thought and comprehension and suggest new conceptions of space that confirm the potential of the human to integrate itself, to be whole and free outside of any predetermined totalizing system. The new spaces of habitation constructed on the existential remnants of war do not celebrate the destruction of an established order, nor do they symbolize or commemorate it. Rather, they accept with a certain pride that what has been suffered and lost, but also what has been gained. They build upon the shattered form of the old order, a new category of order inherent only in present conditions, within which existence feels its strengths, acknowledges its vulnerabilities and failures, and faces up to the need to invent itself as though for the first time, thus seizing the means to continuously refresh and revitalize itself there is an ethical and moral commitment in such an existence and therefore a basis for community. Patterns of choice and invention. The destruction of old cities has shattered their overlaid patterns of spatial and conceptual order. Once the existing patterns have been reduced by violence to a single degraded pattern, they cannot be restored or replaced in any single step. However, there exists within this degraded layer of urban fabric another, more intimate scale of complexity that can serve as the point of origin for a new urban fabric. Ragged tears in walls, roofs, and floor structures created by explosions and fires are complex forms and figurations unique in their history and meaning. No two are alike, yet they all share a common aspect. They have all resulted from the unpredictable effects of forces released in the calculated risks of war. They are the beginnings of new ways of thinking, living and shaping space, arising from individuality and invention. From them, a hierarchical community can be formed, one that precludes the hierarchical basis for organized violence and war. Injections. In the spaces voided by destruction, new structures are injected. Complete in themselves, they do not make an exact fit but exist as spaces within spaces, making no attempt to reconcile the gaps between what is new and old, between two radically different systems of spatial order and of thought. These gaps can only be filled in time. The new structures contain free spaces, the forms of which do not invite occupation with the old paraphernalia of living the old ways of living and thinking. They are, in fact, difficult to occupy and require inventiveness in everyday living in order to become habitable. They are not pre-designed, predetermined, predictable and predictive. They assert no control over the thought and behavior of people by conforming to typologies and coercive programs of use. To pre-established ideologies and their plans to predominate in human activities under the name of an enforced unity of meaning and material, rather they offer a dense matrix of new conditions as an armature for living as fully as possible in the present, 
for living experimentally. The free spaces are, at their inception, useless and meaningless spaces. They become useful and acquire meaning only as they are inhabited by particular people. Traditional links with centralized authority, with deterministic and coercive systems, are disrupted. People assume the benefits and burdens of self-organization. Existence continuously begins again by the reinvention of itself. The scab. The first layer of new construction shields an exposed interior space or void, protecting it during its subsequent transformations. Scab is an ugly word. It would be comforting to find pleasant metaphors to describe the processes of building on the remnants of war, but they would betray the character of the work to be done and the reasons for doing it. The natural stages of healing may not be pretty, judged by conventional aesthetic standards, but they are beautiful in the existential sense, as art and life become one. The need to disguise the actual diminishes until the actual not only appears beautiful, but is. This is so, not simply because whatever exists acquires new meaning and value, but also because Whatever exists suffers an actual transformation because it becomes the subject of the most concentrated human effort. Architecture, the very model of precision and self-exalting intelligence, should not fear its union with what has been the lowest form of human manifestation, the ugly evidence of violence. Architecture must learn to transform the violence even as violence knows how to transform the architecture. Solid state, fluid state. In the regeneration of urban life and its built fabric after war, the separate free spaces remain linked by the old city's fixed network of streets and buildings, disrupted and reduced, though they might be. Heterarchies subsume hierarchies, just as the world of orthogonal order and all its neoplatonic Cartesian assumptions is latent in the freer geometries of natural forms. The unpredicted geometries produced in buildings by war, or the existential geometries of the free space structures themselves. But the refiguration and the re-inhabitation of space is, today, only one dimension of an extended and ever-expanding human condition. The other dimension exists in the tangible but highly fluid domain of electronics and the instruments of a new information age. The flow of information between people on a communal scale bears a conceptual resemblance to the remnants of war in the old city. It is rational in its intentions but unpredictable in its effects. Free spaces contain electronic instrumentation, including the tools of play, essential to experimental living, extending human faculties to experience, to think, and to act. The scar. The deeper level of construction fuses the new and the old, reconciling, coalescing them without compromising either one in the name of a contextual and other form of unity. The scar is marked of pride and of honour, both for what has been lost and what has been gained. It cannot be erased except by the most cosmetic means. It cannot be elevated beyond what it is, a mutant tissue, the precursor of unpredictable regenerations. Acceptance of the scar is an acceptance of existence. Healing is not an illusory cosmetic process, but something that by articulating differences both deeply divides and joins together. The new forms of knowledge, those that give greatest weight to individual cognition and not to abstractions representing the authority of power external to experience, 
mandate a society founded on differences, not similarities between people and things. The city of self-responsible people, of individuals, each of whom tells a personal, even private story, exhibit its unique scars, its transformations in solitude, which are a new kind of history. Increasingly, these will be stories of resourcefulness and invention, more and more distant from conditions created by conformity to social norms.